So welcome, my name is Sal Bell Ofer. Um, I use they them pronouns and I work at the Exploratory and I'm also on the Cultural Connections Board. Um, you are here at our one of our first, um, or the first for this year, for first for 2020, our first virtual webinar about stories from the front line, which is focused on working at museums during the pandemic. Um, and we have some good plans for you. So we'll um, go ahead to the next one. Thank you. Um, so just to start out, we like to think about some, um, you know, our version of sort of a land acknowledgement is to take a minute to highlight some organizations that we um, that we want you to know about. Um, so the Sojourn Sojourn Tay Land Trust is a um, a urban women's indigenous group in the Bay Area that we um, that we think you should check out. Um, the Black Teachers Project is a amazing project to work on. Um, and correcting some of our of the issues around white supremacy within our education field um, and by diversifying our teacher teacher pool. Um, and then the Immigrant Resilience Project Fund um, is a project that gives funding to undocumented um, communities in the Bay Area and in California. So these are three organizations that we want to highlight today. Um, and if there's anything that you'd like to share in the chat of their organization that you suggest people check out, um, we, we would love to hear that. And um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. And so Cultural Connections is a community of Bay Area museums, arts and cultural professionals who meet regularly to exchange ideas, share resources, and inspire creativity. Um, I hope that a bunch of you have come to our events in the past. We used to do in-person tours of museums or and have panels and various things. Um, and over the last year and a half, we've been doing some virtual programming. Um, so upcoming, we have some other ones we have in February, um, some focus around how to center DEI work. Um, we have a career panel coming up, some inclusive language work and some volunteering. So please join our, our mailing list um, to learn more. And I'll try to, oops, I lost my thing, but I'll put that on the chat later so you can um, know where all that information is. Um, great, so you can go to the next slide. And so for today, we wanted to focus on storytelling. Um, and you know, <laughs> how are y'all doing? We hope you're doing okay. Um, it's been a complicated year and even the last few weeks have been really different. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here and process and be together with each other in it. Um, and we decided that storytelling would be a fun way um, for us to sort of impact the, in, to process the impact on the field with each other. Um, since we all have our stories that we, we yeah, because we have our stories that we want to connect, want to hear from y'all. Um, and part of it, you know, a lot of us, a lot of museum folks are not working with frontline workers. So we want to use this as an opportunity to hear directly from folks that are, have been working um, directly with visitors. And um, so we're going to hear from some of those folks. Um, and then, you know, there's this idea of counter story that comes from um, critical race theory that we often kind of create this one idea or kind of narrative of, of uh, what, is, what is happening in the museum field, what's happening during the pandemic. Um, everyone's working from home, which is not true, right? And so, um, so the idea of having this time to hear directly from people gives us a chance to change the story and change the narratives. Um, so we're gonna just go ahead and jump right in. So I'm gonna pass it to Ruby, who's another um, awesome member of Cultural Connections. Hello, welcome everyone. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, our first speaker tonight is Liana Salikova. Liana works at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles and she joined um, there as a visitor services and tour coordinator in the fall of 2019. During the museum's 16 month closure, she built partnerships with several community organizations in San Jose and created engaging outreach programs in the midst of the pandemic. This led to her new role as a Community Engagement and Education Program Manager. Liana, can you share with us more about how your role has changed and what kind of support you received from staff and management during the pandemic? Yeah, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so is, based on the bio, as you can hear, it changed a lot. So if you visited museum in back in 2020, you would probably see me at the front desk. I would greet you, tell you about the museum, or I would be in the galleries, uh, guiding different groups for the museum from schools to seniors. And then now I 
most of the time somewhere outside of the museum building in different communities working uh, now of course in person outdoors uh, with families with different organizations uh, with adults again with variety of ages and it was a uh, it was a journey <laughs> So luckily, uh, because I think we are a small museum and we had a lot of internal and mutual support uh, from the staff and also from the director from the beginning when uh, the pandemic just started, of course, there was uncertainty uh, about our job as a frontline workers. So uh, we were not sure uh, hearing all the news that all organizations are closing, museums are closing, um, all these news, they affected us, of course, but I think very soon in the beginning, uh, our director, she sent out a clear message that uh, she and our board, they have this, uh, decided to keep all this stuff and try to find uh, for everyone remote projects, because in the beginning it was uh, recommended not to be inside the building. I think we pretty much all uh, tried to work from home remotely so we put together all the projects for uh, visitor services to to keep their hours and then uh, I think my this dramatic change in my role it started from the request uh, of one of the community organizations it's a local community farm with Jolution. so they started the new program also because of the pandemic um, delivering food directly to families and they came to the museum asking if we would be interesting interested in bringing some art opportunities to the families. And uh, I think because we were in the, in the midst of changing and deciding our DEIA plan, communities we want to work with. So things just came together uh, perfectly. <laughs> uh, so everyone said yes, the staff was very excited to try it. The director, of course, she supported it. So. Um, we put together some of the first kits uh, to send to these families with the produce boxes and then it, it went very well so we received a good feedback from the community and then uh, started this partnership with one other organization Vigilution. Uh, so it meant that regularly now I needed to to build art kits the thing I've never done before so before I would just demonstrate some other art activities to directly to the families or well, children, children in the museum. So this was something completely new. Uh, I had to learn on the go how to design instruction, make instructions, how to take photos, uh, film all the processes. Uh, yeah, I used all my persuasion skills to force my family members and friends to try these instructions because I wanted to make sure that they are clear before sending them out. So yeah, it was a lot of fun and a lot of work behind the scenes. And I think as soon as we uh, knew that this will be a regular pro project and program, we created, as I call it, a, a production line uh, with the volunteers, some of the staff members, some of the um, interns. So all the materials, again, when museum was closed, I would just send them home to all the volunteers and then they will help me to prepare materials or when museum was more or less open for the staff uh, we would do it in the galleries so it was also nice and then yeah I think uh, last summer when things with COVID started improving and things started to open up uh, it was also an interesting change because uh, we created a lot of programs during the pandemic so a lot of digital programs this outreach program with the art kids and then uh, yeah, planning on museum opening, I think it was a challenge in terms of just deciding and having all these new programs. And then basically when your museum is open, you have to do all the things inside the museum. And then we still have the same, the same small team. <laughs> so the same resources, but it's like twice the work of what we had before. So I think we're still figuring this out. So unfortunately, I don't have a solution for this. So our, our solution was to just slightly reduce, I think, number of digital programs. And then because again, we have very small space, so we cannot have a lot of the things inside the museum. So like school groups, we won't be able to have them at least now. Uh, because of the cap capacity limitation and space limitation. So some of the things they just 
naturally kind of uh, not in the uh, pipeline at the moment, but then eventually at some point we will need to prepare for them. And then I think we're trying to keep everyone safe and I think our community knows the intention. So that's the reason why we don't have a lot of things indoors. But um, yeah, I think what for, for art kids, what I did, um, I transitioned them to off, off site outdoors uh, art activity events uh, monthly in, in the garden, which is from the same organization with Jolution we started to work with during the pandemic. So it, it's really nice because it's right next to the museum. So we can do art activities outside and then people can visit the museum and see everything we talked about during the activity or vice versa. So yeah, I think, and it's also uh, the change of not seeing for so long time visitors and, and interacting with uh, community families, children, and now being right there with them, making all these art, uh, projects and and seeing how people who just join this event participants they they see each other for the first time and they just quickly get connected share some stories help each other with some suggestions how to make the art project better and then yeah I hope to just see this kind of kindness and openness among all other programs we have and also my big wish would be to just yeah grow our our team along with all our programs. So yeah, I think that's, I will probably stop here <laughs> on this good wish <laughs> and dream. Great, thank you, Liana. Um, it sounds like, uh, well, of course I work there, so <laughs> it sounds like that, um, that it was very successful in terms of having support from the museum, like you were saying in the beginning that the board and management decided that, you know, we're gonna, um, keep everybody on staff and so we needed to find things for staff to do and allowed staff to explore some other options um, uh, instead of since they weren't able to do their their regular duties. Um, our next speaker is Casey Dexter Lee and she has worked and lived at Angel Island State Park for 21 years. She helped pilot the distance learning program there she was promoted to a current role as a lead interpreter for the island in 2017. Most recently, Casey was part of the team that developed the park's interpretation master plan, the guiding document for education in the park, and was California State Park's lead on the, on the exhibit design team for the Angel Island Immigration Museum. Angel Island has had some online programs um, in the past, some established online programs. Casey, how did you expand your virtual programming during the pandemic? So for our virtual programs, we were, um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, we're really so fortunate to, uh, to have an existing program because it gave us such a, a quick turnaround. I think we were ready before the teachers even were um, for these types of programs. And um, pr prior to, you know, the museum spaces, the indoor spaces being closed down, we had one person um, that was doing virtual programs. So for California State Parks, that's Ports, Parks, Online Resources for Teachers and Students. It's a statewide uh, California State Park program. And then individual park units participate um, at whatever level they can with whatever staff they can, um, typically seasonal employees. We had a permanent employee doing that as part of their duties, not their sole duties. And so, when we didn't have to have the building any open anymore, it al allowed our two seasonal staff that had been doing the day-to-day -day operations there, um, including kind of front desk entry fees and tours um, to shift into virtual learning. So luckily, because they were existing employees that already gave tours on the site, we just had to teach them the technology. Uh, we were also very for fortunate to have the equipment we needed already. And uh, our cooperating association and a, and a donor also um, got us some additional iPads so we could potentially do simultaneous programs or at least not have to worry about charging and uh, because we move through the space as we do the program. And the programs themselves um, are typically a kind of one-on-one, -on -one, a park staff with a class 
um, previously in their classrooms, but that shifted to um, kids at their homes connecting individually. But especially in those early days, because it wasn't very organized, because the, the schools and, and teachers weren't ready, ready, state parks developed a home learning program um, as an alternative. So basically any individual could connect to a live broadcast that was going on um, and didn't have to be associated with a school. It was just um, age group based and the um, programs were listed for the whole state park <laughs> variety. Um, so if you were uh, K through two, there was a program about elephant seals on Wednesday at 9 a.m. And um, that first year, the, the time slots were age-based. So at 9 a.m. every day, <laughs> there was something um, for those that age students. And then that loosened up as time went on and kind of um, shifted to availability. And especially as more on-demand programs with classes were available to participate in. So we went from um, the occasional distance learning program to um, many, many more. So by the 2020-2021 school year, we uh, had actually shifted people's work schedules because the buildings were still not open. We didn't need staff on the weekends to stock those buildings. So we shifted work schedules to more of the weekdays to accommodate more schools. Uh, and we were at our peak doing four programs four times a day with um, let's say two staff, uh, one permanent employee, one seasonal employee, uh, and so partner, she's part-time, and then I would sub in if they needed um, help or if there was a, a strange program, a one-off program. Um, so our program, our main program for distance learning is at the Immigration Barracks Building at the U.S. Immigration Station site. And we do talk about um, Chinese exclusion laws and um, the poetry that is written on the walls by immigrants detained on the site. So it's a very heavy emotional um, toll to telling this story day in and day out. And so that was something we started to see pretty quickly is some staff burnout. And so it, it's part of it is the repetition of doing the same thing over and over. Part of it is um, the heavy subject. So we, um, the staff was interested in expanding the types of programs we were doing. So we gave them some latitude to say, okay, what are you interested in talking about? Um, and that even happened in the first few months, um, especially for the home learning program. So we had some more variety. So you wouldn't tune in and see the same thing every time. So one uh, employee wanted to do a program about our quarantine station history here, which was very appropriate for <laughs> what was going on at the time. And uh, we didn't have to explain uh, what quarantine was to anyone anymore. That used to be something we used to have to tell people what that was and everyone was right on board and knew exactly what we were talking about. Um, we also did programs on our Civil War history, cannon firings with um, participants watching from home. So all of those things I, I think helped, but what we ended up doing, and I think this is uh, kind of reflecting back to what Liana was saying is we had to scale back. Um, so for this fall, we um, went down to, I think it was three programs, three days a week. And with the buildings reopened now. So those programs are all happening before the buildings even open. Uh, because distance learning presenting, you really can't do it with a mask. It's already challenging enough to connect. Um, so we're doing that before the building's open to the public so that the presenter doesn't have to wear a mask because they're alone in the building. Um, and we don't want to have it happening when the building is occupied by the public. Um, our masking rules basically just go with the county because we are a state agency. We just start follow the county rules. We can't have our own <laughs> rules like they we can't make them more strict than what is um, the regulation in the county so um, Marin County for a while did allow people to come inside without masks um, if they were vaccinated which was all on the honor system because we're not allowed to ask those things as the government um, for visiting a public space so that's challenging it's just trust um, with our visitors um, the staff um, did have to wear masks, but 
uh, that was, uh, there was a lot of nervousness about letting people back into the building and uh, with our supervisor as well, a lot of um, taking our <laughs> feelings on this into account um, as far as when we opened, how we opened, what would make the staff feel safe um, and try and maximize that. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to look at the start time. I don't know we're on a time crunch. Yeah, you got about one, two minutes. Okay. Uh, and so we also had some challenges with site access. Um, we are an island and the only way to get here is by ferry or private boat. Uh, ferries shut down um, mid-March 2020. Uh, we didn't have any ferry service to the park for three months or so. Uh, and then we started getting uh, weekend service from Tiburon and then uh, by September 2020, we had San Francisco service as well, um, still part of the week, um, not all seven days. Uh, we still don't have seven day service from Tiburon, um, but San Francisco service is now seven days a week. Um, so that's a challenge, right? And that's an equity issue as well. Like if you own a boat, you could come here, but if you don't, you couldn't. Um, and so that was uh, again, another reason why this virtual program is so important. Uh, and then we also opened uh, this museum, the Angel Island Immigration Museum, uh, last weekend. <laughs> and so we were doing exhibit design, um, all kinds of challenges with that, um, production, installation, out of state, having workers come um, to install in uh, November of 2021. Um, took another year to get it open after that. So we wanted to have a 2000 person event in our you know, imagination years ago on this, uh, for this big event uh, that went down to, okay, we're gonna do 150. And then we're like, okay, we're gonna do hundred. And so last weekend we had 25 people in a virtual event. Um, so we just had to adjust uh, as we all have been <laughs> for the last couple of years here and just make it work. Um, but we were able to um, insert a little bit, just a couple little things to acknowledge COVID because we do have a medical gatekeeping um, panel, a couple panels. And um, that was really important to us, even though we were doing those des design decisions in April of 2020 at the very, very beginning of the pandemic. And we didn't know the outcomes. Um, obviously, we still don't know the entire outcome of this, but we knew that if we didn't at least acknowledge it, um, especially when talking about this historic and contemporary medical gatekeeping, our, our exhibit would be out of date the day it opened. So we were able to sneak that in. Yeah, so it sounds like um, the part about opening the museum could be a whole talk by itself, I'm sure. <laughs> Making adjustments there. And I think the last thing you said is also very interesting. You know, the thing about being topical and then being right up to the minute and how that can change at any moment. Um, thank you, Casey. Our next speaker is Los uh, Tenorio, public yeah. program presenter at the California Academy of Sciences. Los has worked at many museums of California, including the Aquarium of the I'm sorry, Aquarium of the Bay in San Francisco, the Hayward Shoreline Interpretive Center, the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, and the Page Museum at the La Brea Tar Pits. At the beginning of the pandemic, he was an instructor for Florida State University's Office of STEM Teaching Activities in the Biology Department. But Loss is back in California now <laughs> at the Exploratorium and is currently with the public program staff at the California Academy of Sciences. So Loss, how did you change your outreach programs in response to the pandemic? Yeah, that was such an interesting time. Um, and, and the thing about it too was, um, we we started changing stuff actually towards when when the pandemic started because we were starting to wind down um but we had the big summer camps that were actually coming up which was a real real big challenge um you know we were actually getting the students um getting all the stuff ready before we were told hey you know we can't you can't do the summer camps like you would normally do it so when we got the word of like yeah he you can't do in person anymore um we were all rushing we were all trying to figure out okay what is it we can do what what are our options and that was really the biggest thing for 
the head of, of the program we were doing, he, um, he really pushed to see if there were alternatives to doing the, the summer camps because we, he, we already had people sign up for it. We already had the kids sign up for it. And so he was trying to figure out a way to be able to continue it to some degree. Um, and it was, to me, it was a really incredible time just because it kind of showed, a, showed how tight of a group, how tight of a team we actually had um, because he was trying to make sure that we're, we were able to at least still be kind of employed or at least be active in some way or, or another. So along with trying to come up with ideas, we started looking at what other places did. We were looking at zoo websites, um, other locations that had programs that, that could have virtual pro programs themselves. Um, but yeah, it was a really, really eye-opening experience just because a lot of it was us figuring things out on the fly, you know, try and figure it out as we were doing it. And we have a visitor over here. Um, hi, Pearl. Um, so basically what we end up doing is we, we got different ideas. We did a lot of it virtually. Obviously, we couldn't really meet up with, with the students at all. And one of the biggest highlights for the camp itself was we would actually go out on boats to actually do collecting, otter trials, saying, saying netting, um, and actually show the kids, these are kind of the stuff that lives in, 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 the, um, in the water. And well, that was out, we couldn't really take the kids in. So we were running kind of like, almost like chickens with our heads cut off, trying to figure out, okay, is this gonna work, this is gonna work. Um, and we came up with, with, I felt like some really snazzy ideas um, because even though we couldn't be with the kids, we could actually show them the stuff that, that we can kind of replicate it even if it was virtual. So for example, with the boats, we would still go on the boats, but it would just be the person who was throwing the boat and the camera person. And even then, it was still a bit of a challenge because we, were, we still had to keep our distance from each other. We we'll still had to have masks on. Um, but the idea is like, you know, if, if we can connect via Zoom, kind of make it live, like a live stream event where we're showing them, we're actually collecting in real time, the kids can actually see it and they can actually ask us questions. So they're interacting with us. So what we end up doing was a lot of kind of activity where we would go to spots um, individually. <laughs> I was one of them where we would drive out. I would drive out, find a spot. Let's check out what's out here. Um, we even nicknamed it like the, the person on the street segment of the camp. But the idea is, you know, it was kind of tough. So we were figuring stuff out like that. We were also kind of trying to add a little bit of humor to it to kind of, you know, maintain morale up. Um, but it also became a really good test bed for activities that we could do once the semester came up again for outreach programs. Because since we couldn't visit schools anymore, um, we were still offering programs to the schools with the understanding that, yeah, these are going to be out, um, Zoom programs, essentially. And it was, again, like I said, it was a big learning, learning curve there. Um, a lot of what we tested during the summer camps worked really well with it. But part of the challenge too was also there, there was a component for, for the outreach programs where, you know, the, the students got to touch, to feel the animals, to actually have a one-on-one -on -one encounter, which we couldn't do at all. So it, it pushed us into trying to think of different ways of, of doing things. And again, it was kind of, I, I always feel like it was one of those moments where we could shine coming up with different ideas. So a lot of it, we, we, we kind of let loose. We were going into exploring ideas of kinesthetics with the little young ones, you know, let's move like hermit crabs do. What, what, let's practice how they move. Um, with the older ones, it became more of really science inquiry of like, what do you see? explain to us your observations, you know? So even though they were missing a component of that, of, of the actual physical encounter with it, 
we, we kind of, it helped us kind of shore up and, and strengthen the other aspects around it too of, of exploration itself. Um, and it went actually really well. I mean, I ended up moving from Florida to California. And even during that time, I was still active participating in the, in the, out, in the outreach programs because there was Zoom. And so that was the other thing too, is with, with our supervisor, he, he really tried to keep us all on board, you know? And it wasn't just in terms of keeping us doing the programs, but even also he was encouraging us to like, we, I wanna hear your ideas. I want to know what you think. He was very, very open to, to new things and new ideas. And, you know, it really, it really showed because we, like I said, we, we experimented, we tested and a lot of the stuff ended up becoming part of what we did in, in terms of programs. And oftentimes we get feedback from the, um, from the, from the teachers themselves of saying like, you know, this is fantastic. This is great. We, we didn't know if you were going to still be offering these programs and even though we can you know it's different from what we used to do it's still very valuable um experience too so you know to me yeah it was a hard time but you know there were those moments in which we were like this is this is our time to shine this is our time to be able to actually interact in a different way try out new ideas um and seeing if they work. And I think that kind of bled in a lot afterwards when I came back to California and I ended up going to the Exploratorium, for example, um, over to the Cal Academy where, you know, with, with their support too, it's like, hey, I can try to do these ideas I have, um, you know, and it was, it was a very, very different experience going back into interacting with with people again too um you know i was doing the whole zoom outreach programs for a while just virtually and then going back into it into the real world again it's like this is it's different it's kind of and i'm and even to a degree right now too i'm still kind of trying to get used to it too um in terms of what i can and what i can't do you know um before in the past we I would be a lot more active in, in getting larger groups together to get stuff done. And now it's like, no, has have to think about it differently. So it's definitely a challenge, but from all the places I've been in, in terms of the experience, it's been incredible because at least it's given me ideas on what, how to explore these new challenges. And um, I'm down to 28 seconds. So I think I'll just finish up with that. That's great. Thank you, Los. Yeah, I think that some, um you know, uh, not everything is bad, right? No. <laughs> some silver lining in that uh, you like um, some of the others able to explore some new ideas and learn some new skills and really have the students benefit from all of that. And you're able to take that with you as you move forward. So I think that's really terrific. And our last speaker is um, Andrea Parker or Dre. Dre has um, been in a variety of public facing positions with the Presidio Trust since 2007. As a visitor services manager, she co-manages the Presidio Visitor Center with her colleagues from the National Park Service and Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. She also manages a special event staff that oversees all the outdoor events at the Presidio. She is currently busily preparing for the opening of the new Presidio Tunnel Tops, a 14 acre parkland due to open in the spring of 2022. So Dre, how did staff weather the pandemic and how easy was it for staff to shift the outdoor programming? Were there any obstacles? Yeah, um, well, thank you for, for the introduction, Ruby. I appreciate that. And actually one of the images in the introduction slide is the new tunnel tops, which we hope to be opening sometime uh, later in the spring. And I'll, I'll allude to that a little bit um, in my closing marks, but I guess my story might be a little bit different from some of the other panelists in that I work in the Presidio. The Presidio is a national park site located within the Golden Gate National Recreation Area where this 1500 acre beautiful parkland, former army base. Um, we do have a museum, a cultural institution inside the officers club. 
Um, I will kind of fast forward and say the officers club closed immediately when we were all sent home to work from home um, on that fateful day on March 16th, 2020. Um, the officers club actually just recently reopened um, in September. We were only able to open it one day a week on Saturdays to the public. Um, but, um, you know, in some ways we were very lucky because, you know, we have this beautiful park and knowing that um, being outdoors was much safer than being indoors, we, we were able to spread people out. So, you know, we, we quickly, you know, there was no handbook for the pandemic. None of us really knew how to, how to manage through the pandemic. We were all sent home on March 16th. We scrambled very quickly to get our staff set up with home offices. We had to find enough laptops because not everybody had laptops. Um, some people went home with desktops, um, you know, and over the course of the la next last two years, we've all sort of morphed into having laptops. Um, but it really was, um, we were sort of building the plane as we were flying it, which I think we were all pretty much doing at this time. And, and I actually want to give a shout out to one of my colleagues who's on this call, Arisha Martinez Johnson. I'll, I'll talk about a bit of the work that she and I did together. Uh, and Michael Fall from the National Park Service. So some familiar faces. Um, you know, we st quickly started thinking, well, should we do virtual programming? That might be the way to go. Um, but so many other cultural institutions were doing virtual programming and we were a bit slow to sort of implement the virtual programming. GGNPC, our, our Parks Conservancy partner did a great job of implementing virtual programming. Um, so we really focus on outdoors and what we could do outdoors. So one of the things we did is implement slow streets in the Presidio, which uh, created these kind of closed roads that allowed for people to be outdoors and social distance. We put a lot of windmasters in the park that kind of talked about etiquette, you know, wear your mask, social distance. We have these large lawns that people could hang out on. Um, but I, I will say there's, there, it's, it's, you know, there were some wonderful moments in the in the pandemic, but we unfortunately did have to lay off about 20% of our staff. And many of those reductions came from my department um, because we were all public serving frontline employees working at the visitor center, working at the officers club, doing educational programs. Um, all of the work we did was very public. And, and so once those programs were no longer, we were no longer able to have them, the trust is, um, we're a unique federal agency in that we get all of our, our revenue is from uh, the, the commercial and rental real estate program. We don't get any federal appropriations from Washington, DC. We are mandated to be financially self-sufficient. And when people started you know, not paying their rent or businesses closed, that put us in a bit of a financial difficult situation. And so of the 20% of the layoffs, 23 of those people came from my department. So we're really kind of a, a bit of a shell of our former self. And I will just say that it was pretty much an, a very emotionally overwhelming and, and terrible experience. And I say that from a place of privilege because I still have a job. Um, so there was a lot of guilt, frankly, for a lot of our employees who kept their jobs and, and just feeling very shattered for the ones who did lose their jobs. Um, so I don't wanna be a downer there. You know, we did pivot and we managed to, to kind of make it work. And, People did change a lot of what you know their roles and responsibilities were, and, and I'll, I'll speak to Arisha, who's on this call. Um, one of the things we quickly did was we knew we had Rob Hill Campground, this amazing campground, one of the one of two in San Francisco. We were getting calls from schools in San Francisco who were interested in having outdoor classrooms, um, you know, to have safer social distancing. And so instead of doing overnight camping, which wasn't allowed in California, we followed all the state rules. First, we followed all the local rules. Then we went to the state. Then we went to federal. Um, Arisha and I put together a program. We had, a, we had to create a whole new permit, this like 15-page permit that had COVID provisions in it to keep people safe. We had to get proper insurance from the schools. Um, but we opened up Rob Hill Campground, and we allowed schools to reserve it. They did pay us a fee to have the campground. Um, but they were using it for outdoor classrooms. And it was just such a wonderful thing to go there the first day and see kids so happy to see each other and, and, and be able to see their teachers and get back together. I do think children really were suffering tremendously during the pandemic. 
Um, and, and we were able to start doing outdoor events once some of these restrictions lifted so to generate a little bit of revenue. And uh, we have a beautiful outdoor art exhibit called My Park Moment, which is this art exhibit that celebrates people using parks and it's curated by uh, non-professional photographers and professional photographers. I invite you to visit that. And I see I'm coming up on my time, so I'll, I'll kind of come to an end. And one of the things that we're really excited about that's on the horizon is the opening of Tunnel Tops. And I do get to hire, we're, we're finally in a position to, we had a hiring freeze, but I am actually gonna be able to hire four new employees uh, very soon. So ping me um, or go to our website, presidio.gov and check out some of the new job openings that we're having. It's really, I feel like we're sort of in a turning point right now. So I'll leave it at that and thank you for your time. And I'll look forward to the breakout sessions where I can answer more questions. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, so exciting to hear about the new park and that um, you're hiring. Always exciting to hear about that. All right, so we're gonna be switching. Sal, did you want to yeah, um, we're, we don't need the slides, but um, yeah, we're going to break you into groups of about four or five people. Um, and I'm going to put in the chat just a couple of questions to get you started. Um, so if you want to talk about any specific things that came up, you may, you most likely will not be with one of the panelists, um, but you'll be with a smaller group of folks. Um, but you can share some of the patterns or themes that you noticed in the stories. Um, if there are stories that you want to share that came up for you, um, the, over the last few years, either personally or professionally, things that came up when you were listening to other people. And, and then also just to kind of think about, were there anything that you heard or felt different in the stories? So were there any, any, um, anything about the narratives of the stories that were different than maybe what is commonly told about the impact of the, of the pandemic? Um, so we'll go ahead and break you into rooms and then we'll come back. Um, we're gonna do about like seven minutes in rooms um, and then we'll just come back for a final reflection and uh, appreciation. So. So mostly we just want to end on if there's any burning questions that you have for panelists, um, you're welcome to throw that into the chat and, um, or if you want to reach out to anyone that you've connected with in the small group, um, you can message them privately and give them your email address. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll give a few, few minutes for people to give, put any questions they have in the chat. Otherwise, um, I just want to give a shout out to Russell, Russell um, Nauman, who's doing our, our tech support right now, part of Culture Connection. So thank you. Um, him and Ruby and I plan this together. And thank you for all the storytellers. Um, and yeah, any any questions or Ruby, did you have any final thoughts you want to share? I think, um, you know, as you were indicating, Sal, there were all kinds of different things happening. So for some people, um, their organization was able to hold on most to most of their staff and for others that wasn't really possible um, trying to figure out how to maximize what everybody had, which might be outdoor space and if you didn't have outdoor space finding outdoor space. Shifting duties for some people that was um, a welcome change or an invigorating change or something that was really something that they can carry with them. And for others that was maybe not a comfortable change, maybe doing things that they actually didn't want to be doing. And um, so that's a little bit difficult. So again, all these different kinds of stories for the people at the front line. And so, you know, we, we're all part of that and we all appreciate all of you. And thank you for sharing your stories with us today. <laughs>